Um, cool. So uh, welcome once again. Uh, this is Intro to GraphQL. Uh, my name is Preston So. Um, I uh, have been working with Drupal for about eight years now. Um, I currently work uh, at Acquia doing research and development, and um, I'm also very involved in the Drupal community, as you can see. Um, here's some ways to get in touch with me. Uh, that's my Drupal.org username. There's my Twitter handle and my website. However, if you go to my website right now, you'll see it's a big fat error because I'm currently upgrading it to Drupal 8. So, um, <laughs> you know, we all have very little time for our side projects. So, great. Um, so, here's what we're going to cover. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about um, GraphQL. And this might be a little new because, you know, this is something that's not really part of the Drupal ecosystem in the traditional sense. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that is. Uh, I want to talk about the origins motivations, what actually galvanized the development of GraphQL, why is GraphQL so important from our perspective. Um, I want to talk about the relationship between GraphQL and REST, um, because there's a lot of confusion in this area, a lot of people who, who believe that you know, GraphQL might be sort of the, the you know, fire and brimstone for REST, which is actually kind of not true. They, they can really coexist. Um, and I, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about GraphQL syntax, going into what actually constitutes a GraphQL operation, what actually constitutes um, a GraphQL uh, a query or a mutation. And finally, I want to talk uh, about types and schemas, um, which are you know, much more about um, what actually can you do in terms of introspection and writing your own schema and integrating that with your Drupal site. And the last thing I want to talk about is just briefly uh, GraphQL and Drupal. What can you do with Drupal 8 uh, with GraphQL? Uh, what's the future look like? Um, and just some, some open discussion. Um, one thing I do want to note is that GraphQL is a very new spec. It's only been out for four months. And actually, I had to make some modifications to this presentation at the last minute because they've made some recent updates to the, to the spec. So, you know, I'm just as new to this as many of you are. Um, so, you know, I would love to have an open discussion at the end about sort of what the impact of GraphQL might be on Drupal, where we see, uh, you know, some, some great opportunities for us to work together um, with this exciting new Facebook open source um, system. So, without further ado, uh, let's go into origins and motivations. What is GraphQL? Why did they decide at Facebook that this was, that this was a great idea? What's the history? Um, and because none of us in here uh, are JavaScript engineers, I do want to just delve a little bit into React just to show you why this is so compelling and why Facebook has been using this for such a long time. So what is GraphQL? Well, simply put, GraphQL is A, a declarative query language. And I'll talk a little bit more about what declarative means in this sense. And an application level protocol. Now, what this means is that if you have two applications, right, one of which is built on the back end, one of which is built on the front end, these can communicate with each other through GraphQL. And I'll talk a little bit more about how you actually set that integration layer up. Um, so Facebook has really reached out into the open source to a great extent lately. There's a lot of really awesome work that Facebook is doing um, in terms of open sourcing its work. And one of those is React. Now, um, you guys might be familiar with JavaScript MVC frameworks. Uh, you know, which are all well and good, like Angular, Backbone, Ember. React is very different because rather than focusing on all three letters of the MVC paradigm, React really uh, tries to focus on just the view. And the reason why is because React has a very unique approach to producing these views um, that makes it really compelling from the standpoint of, you know, if you've already got a backend that you've already built up and you've already got your, your, your model pretty robustly set up, you really only need a view-based application layer anyways. Um, so uh, it uses what's called a virtual DOM. If you've heard of things like the Shadow DOM and Web Components, uh, a virtual DOM is, is kind of an approximate of the Shadow DOM. It's not really the same thing because the virtual DOM is saved entirely on uh, uh, Facebook's um, state machine. It's not actually something that you can visibly look at. Um, and what the virtual DOM does is it saves your application state. So anytime you want to have, uh, you've changed something in the UI and you want your application state to reflect that, React will save that in uh, a property known as this.state. And what happens is, Rather than uh, like Angular, for, you know, for example, one of the big problems with Angular is that every time you want to change something with Angular, anytime you want to have a directive attached, you know, put in some new data, you actually have to parse the entire DOM and go through and figure out all the directives. Now, this changes with Angular too, but React actually solves this problem by dividing your application to different components and allowing you to diff uh, different components based on the differences in state. Um, and that's a really compelling idea because now you no longer have to worry about things like re-rendering the entire DOM, uh, which might happen um, because it's such a very strongly componentized um, system. Now, what is Relay? So Relay uh, is a very recent framework that just came about. Relay is um, basically a means of co-locating data fetching needs, namely GraphQL queries, and React components that are basically the view-based markup written in JSX that, that, um, that you might be familiar with if you know React. 
Um, we, so we lay, you know, basically what that does is it connects view logic to queries in the back end. Um, so this is Facebook's uh, basically middleware between React and GraphQL. So with that in mind, what about GraphQL? Well, GraphQL is a query language that consolidates RESTful queries into a unified response. Um, and also returns data according to the same, square, the, the, the same schema that the request query provides. What does that mean? Uh, well, we'll get, you know, we'll get into that shortly. So what is um, GraphQL? Well, in reality, Facebook has been using GraphQL for several years now. You just might not realize it. Um, if you've ever used an iOS application uh, for Facebook or um, an Android application for Facebook, you will have used GraphQL at some point. Um, it was invented when Facebook decided to move over from HTML5 to more of the you know, sort of Objective-C Java native mobile application uh, approach. And it also predates Relay by three years. So Relay is something that Facebook made specially for uh, the connection between React and GraphQL. So here's a quote from Nick Schrock, who's one of the creators of GraphQL. Instead of placing data fetching logic in some other part of the client application, as is the case with things like you know, with Angular or Ember, um, or embedding this logic in a custom endpoint on the server, which is what we do today with a lot of RESTful approaches, um, we instead co-locate a declarative data fetching specification, which is the query language slash application level protocol that GraphQL is, alongside the React component. Now, what does this look like? Um, so the client requests and the server payloads adhere to the same shape. And I'll show you this really directly very shortly, and you'll see why this is so powerful. The client dictates what the server provides. Each component declares what it needs. So if you're working with front-end components in React, you no longer have to rely on a sort of large, comprehensive knowledge of what your queries are going to look like, because you can attach your queries to your component and get the data that way. And there's no over or under fetching, because you're relying solely on what you're requesting from the component, which means you don't get any sort of bleed or, or uh, uh, a bloat when it comes to responses. So here's a quick introduction to React. I do want to talk about this very briefly, even though we're not a JavaScript uh, community, because I think it's very, very illustrative. And you'll see just how simple it is and why so many people have jumped onto React. So let's imagine that we have a, we have a data model that looks something like this, right? We have an article, and an article has a title, a path, and an author. Now, an author, in this case, is a nested entity that has a name and a location, right? So here's what that would look like. And I hope that's big enough, by the way. Let me see if I can zoom in a little. Uh, let's see, this is the problem with Reveal.js. This is my first time using Reveal.js, by the way. I usually use Keynote or PowerPoint. Um, but I decided to you know, try something new today. <laughs> so what this is doing, um, and I'm sorry if you, if you can't see it very well. Um, we can all scoot up, you know, scoot up a little bit. What this is doing is it's declaring a render method um, for React to create a template. right? Now, if you look, you'll notice, wait, there's some syntax errors here. What is this you know, HTML that's being put directly inside the parentheses for uh, 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 that return statement. Well, you know, basically this is known as JSX, which is a templating language that allows um, you to write HTML as you would, or you know, as you can see, it looks very similar to something like Twig. And what you can do is um, React will actually take this markup that you've written in JSX and collapse it down to JavaScript that it then interprets and fills in um, with data. So in this case, what we've got is we've got our nice um, BEM style article list item, and we've got each of our this.props. Now, this.props is the properties object uh, within React, and that's where you get all of your, of your, that's where all your data is bound to, right? So in this case, we're getting the path, we're getting the title of the article, we're getting the author's name and the author's location. As you can see, you'll notice that the relationship that we just built up here is reflected in the way that it's constructed in this.props object. So um, now if we take a step back and we say, all right, well, let's put in some relay logic. What we can do is we can actually write a GraphQL query that returns the object that we need to use with this with, with, um, this.props within our JSX template. What does this look like? Well, that's the simple sort of uh, the simplest form of the query that we have, right? Article, title, path, author, name, location. As you can see, there's nesting, there's hierarchy. This is how you write a query. There's no complicated, you know, having to look at, uh, for example, with, 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 with SQL, let's say, you don't have to look at keywords and then look at the strings and figure out what the hierarchy is, because GraphQL literally provides you the hierarchy right there, and the query returns this response. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, wow, that's, that's pretty magical. I mean, literally, we wrote a query, and what we get back as the response is the same thing. Now, this is a pretty powerful idea, right? Because right now what happens is if you have a client application that requests some kind of data, there's not really any way for the client application to influence that data. There's no way for the client to influence the schema. 
But what if we supply the schema from the client and request that the server provide the schema that we have, uh, provide data according to the schema that we've provided? Then things become really interesting. So that's the sort of secret sauce of GraphQL, and that's how it works in the context of React and Relay. So, um, you know, if you, you know, so you, so you might have thought, well, this is pretty awesome, right? This is kind of like one of those things that's back to the future, right? <laughs> and if you think about it, you know, it's, you know, since it is back to the future week, I decided to use um, some examples uh, uh, that sort of do this tongue in cheek kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, so it is very much, GraphQL is very much sort of uh, a technology of the future. It's really forward looking in terms of what it really envisions uh, the future of, of queries being. So, with that, let's move on. So what about REST? Okay, so we've got you know, all these existing architectural approaches like SOAP and REST. How does GraphQL fit in this whole uh, scheme? Well, the first thing I wanna talk about is, is there, there's some pretty key limitations of REST that we need to address. And this is one of the, one of the big, uh, uh, you know, uh, big sort of um, arguments that people have been having about how uh, um, uh, RESTful architectures today, and especially decoupled Drupal, um, are maybe not such a good idea from a, from a server, per, uh, server performance perspective or from a variety of different perspectives. Now here's uh, a quick list. So REST requires you to use many endpoints. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more. Let's see here, yeah, there we go. So oftentimes what you do is when you write your RESTful API, your RESTful API doesn't just stay and stay the same, right? It changes very considerably. When you have uh, you know, new client needs, you have another application you've got to introduce on a specific view of a resource, you've got to basically extend your endpoints to be more and more, to do more and more work and provide more and more data. Now what this does is, you know, if you have trees of related resources and nested entities and all this kind of stuff, this leads to a lot of problematic endpoint creation, right? Because the, because the point, at the point that you're provisioning an endpoint, you have to think to yourself, well, you know, I've got this other view that this application needs, I've got this other thing that this mobile application needs. And so you've got to really think about, well, you know, most RESTful architectures today use bespoke endpoints, which means that you're basically creating the endpoints, you know, as you see fit within your architecture. Um, that's the problem. What about response bloat? Well, you know, again, due to a REST, uh, REST API's changing uh, requirements, clients that only need just a limited amount of data might have to grapple with this huge amount of data that's being destined, that's destined for other clients. So let's, for example, say that you have an Android application that you only really want to receive certain information from a user. Um, if you have a desktop application that's being served by that same REST API, you're going to end up having a huge amount of data because, as we expect, you know, the desktop application can handle a lot more data and a much larger payload than a mobile device in a variable network condition, right? So this kind of problem is really well illustrated by this set of GET requests, right? We have users that are in groups, but we really want to get a list of users in those groups with IDs, right? There's not really a good way to do this. Right now, if we were to really think about this hard, we would say, okay, well, you know, we need three GET requests. We need some kind of a, a, a series of requests to get the data that we need, which really increases the response bloat and, of course, increases the number of round trips. So if what is fetch free review happens to be relational as much Drupal data tends to be, um, you're gonna need to have multiple client server round trips. Not only that, you're also gonna need to bootstrap the entire Drupal application, right? Because Drupal is not gonna just provide you any data unless you bootstrap it. Um, and that delays the render process. So your time to first paint is significantly extended by that. Um, and this is one of the big arguments against using a decoupled Drupal architecture. There's also no or limited backwards compatibility. Now, this is really sort of a, a, a philosophical problem with REST itself, uh, with, with the ways, sorry, not with REST itself, that's um, very re reductive, but the way REST APIs tend to be built these days. Um, nowadays, you have versioning. So you have, you know, your endpoints are located at places like API slash V1, API slash V2. We use semantic versioning, it's great. But the problem is that once you change the version of your API, you know, that becomes obsolete. You have to uh, uh, adapt to the needs of your client. And of course, once you have all of your front-end logic already written, you have to rewrite front-end logic. So rather than just writing, uh, rewriting back-end logic to handle new queries, you're having to rewrite all of your queries. And that adds a whole lot of technical debt. And there's also very limited or no introspection. Most, you know, most REST APIs that we find written nowadays really lack um, a sort of native schema or formalized type system that allows you to really dig in, drill down, and figure out what your types are that you're dealing with, because that can be a very, very tough uh, problem in REST APIs, especially when you're expecting a string, but you get an integer instead. So that makes our lives difficult as well. Now, uh, so before we dig into the code, I do want to <laughs> delve into how GraphQL solves each of these problems. 
So with GraphQL, you only really need one endpoint because that one endpoint um, for, 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 uh, for uh, most intents and purposes is going to actually resolve your large uh, GraphQL query into smaller queries, right? And it's going to do that intelligently depending on how your server is set up. Now, of course, you have to write the server. You have to write a GraphQL server, and I'll talk a little bit about that in short order. And that can send back a single unified response. Then you get tailored responses like we saw earlier with the Marty McFly example. Um, Client-driven queries means just that. You, as the client, get to drive the query and the response. Um, the response is catered to the demands of the client rather than to the limitations of the API. And we've probably all confronted a lot of limitations that REST APIs have. Um, so, uh, and what, you know, then there's also fewer round trips, right? A GraphQL server takes a single query, splits that query, recombines you know, the multiple responses that it gets, and then sends back a single response. So you never get more than one round trip, and hopefully, depending on how you've set up your schema with your Drupal implementation, if you're using Drupal, um, should be able to accommodate multiple relationships with just one single uh, bootstrap. Now, backwards compatibility. So this is really compelling as well. From the perspective of API versioning, when you submit a GraphQL query, you're not really in any sort of awareness of what version that API is. What this means is that if you have an API v1 and an API v2, and you submit an identical query to both, you will get an identical response from both. That, you know, it means that if you, you know, with the traditional REST architecture right now, if you submit uh, a query to one uh, version of your API, you will get back a certain response that is immutable, that you can't change. But if you submit it to a, the second version, you'll get a similar sort of, you know, even more extensive object of data that you might not have wanted. Um, and basically what backwards compatibility means in this case is that, you know, any version of the API you query, as long as you know that those uh, uh, properties are available, feel free to use them. Um, and introspection. So introspection, uh, GraphQL has a very, uh, has a native and highly extensible schema and text system, which I'm gonna delve into a little bit towards the end. Um, and with that, uh, let's talk a little bit about why GraphQL, and then, I'll, and then we'll dig into some code. Um, so GraphQL is sort of like a common vernacular between server and client, and it's also very similar to JSON, as you might have noticed, uh, which makes it very easy to onboard front-end developers, or even people who might not be uh, engineers like us, because GraphQL, at its core, is a very descriptive and very simple way of expressing hierarchies. Um, GraphQL accelerates the arrival of your query's response by, pre by preventing multiple requests that you don't need um, or preventing you, to, you know, from having to bootstrap your application multiple times. And now this, of course, relies on how you've built and architected your GraphQL server. Um, so GraphQL is transport agnostic, which means that you don't necessarily have to use the HTTP protocol like REST. Um, you could, if you wanted to, use things like WebSockets or uh, uh, MQTT if you even wanted to, which makes the sort of possibilities for this really interesting because it means that we ne don't necessarily have to do all this nasty you know, stuff with HTTP. If we really want to, of course, HTTP2 looks great, but if we wanted to, we could use other transport protocols. And also, it's database agnostic, which means that you can use GraphQL against a SQL database, you can use GraphQL against a MongoDB database, it doesn't matter. What matters is that the server is able to deserialize your query and turn it into um, a logic on the back end that will integrate with those databases. Now, of course, before <laughs> we get too involved, I want to cut through the hype a little bit and say GraphQL is great, but it's not necessarily the best. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of counter arguments to GraphQL. Basically, people are saying, well, this adds another layer of unneeded abstraction to our integration process, right? Different requirements for views can be satisfied by provisioning additional REST endpoints. Yeah, that's a great idea, but this process arbitrarily adds more endpoints. So it's, it really comes down to what your sort of uh, API needs are. Um, HTTP can handle parallel network requests. So right now, if you uh, 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 um, try to um, do multiple requests, uh, HTTP can actually handle multiple ones. Um, so this is great if you need to fetch assets or if you need to perform queries, let's say, against the database. Um, but of course, there's certain limitations, right? HTTP 1.1 recommends that you only use two parallel network requests. Chrome accepts six. Um, now, HTTP 2, the new specification that's coming out that uh, is, is, is about that protocol, uh, may actually mitigate this process. I haven't looked too much at the HTTP 2, so uh, um, you know, it should be interesting to see what, what happens from there. Um, another big, big problem is that um, you know, there's a lot of uh, a, a consternation about reinventing the wheel. And the reason why is because the type system that exists in GraphQL is analogous to the HTTP content type system. And uh, what's really interesting is that 
Um, with HTTP, you can provide a different header and get back a different version of a document at a single endpoint. So if you wanted to, this, this is good for things like, you know, if you're creating your own multilingual application or if you're creating your own uh, uh, versioning that you want to have um, and you want to, you know, provide different versions of the document at the same endpoint. Now, content negotiation means, well, we don't really need to totally reinvent a new type system, but I'll talk a little bit more about why GraphQL's type system rocks. Um, uh, so there we go. That's exactly what I just said. Um, and, you know, of course, we can also integrate it with standards such as JSON schema. So if you want to get going now, uh, and you want to try this out right now, uh, you can get this, um, uh, Rising Stack has this GraphQL server. Now, uh, it's currently built using Node.js and MongoDB, so if you have, if you have um, some knowledge of MongoDB and, and, and uh, integrating with a, or interacting with the MongoDB database, you can download this right now. Um, and if you'd like, uh, even set up some of these um, uh, hierarchies yourself um, that we can query against. Now, I don't expect everyone will be able to get set up live on this because it's, it's quite cumbersome, um, but definitely please do check it out for your later development and experimentation. So let's delve a little bit into GraphQL syntax, and once again, I do want to note that the, um, the spec is in a lot of flux. Uh, the spec is in, in a considerable amount of, of change, and as a result, some of this stuff may not be accurate even a month or two from now. Um, but and I also do want to note also, I'm, I'm using color coding here, but GraphQL being the new language that it is, is not currently recognized by Highlight.js, so you might see some odd color coding in the GraphQL examples. I'll make a note whenever uh, an example is in GraphQL or whether it's in JSON. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, operations, selection sets, fields and aliases, fragments, variables, directives, and mutations. If you don't know what any of that stuff is, it's totally fine. <laughs> so GraphQL models two types of operations. Now I say models because GraphQL is, again, an abstraction layer that provides you with the means of performing these operations against databases. So um, the first is query. Um, and it's a read-only fetch, which means that any of the stuff you're putting in your query is what you're gonna get back. A mutation, however, um, takes a write method that we'll look into very shortly, and then it performs a fetch on the data that you select within your mutation operation. Now these operations can be named and those names are case sensitive. Uh, one quick note, uh, the spec tends to use camel case. Um, underscores are also uh, 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 significant if you decide to use uh, snake case. Um, uh, and uh, now, uh, one of the really great things is that queries, however, can be anonymous. So if you um, want to make your queries look exactly like your JSON output, you can create a re uh, read query just like this. And they have a shorthand. Now, what are selection sets? Well, selection sets are basically the fields that you're fetching from within your query. Um, in this case, let's say that we have um, a database that has you know, some arbitrary amount of information and we're fetching first names, last names, and emails, right? If there's only one row in this database, we're going to get this JSON output, right? So we got first name Marty, last name McFly, email Marty at McFly.net. Do we have a lot of Back to the Future fans in here? Yes? No? Okay, I hope so. Because I wrote these examples, hoping that there will be. <laughs> All right, great. So one note I want to make is that, as you can see, once again, the JSON output literally matches the schema that you provided. Now, what's great about this is if we reorder any of these fields, we're going to get the same order of the fields that we sent back in the response. So it's a really powerful uh, mechanism for querying. Now, um, fields that are selected are separated by carriage returns. Um, which are significant. Now, back in the day, it used to be comma separated. So that's one note. You might see some tutorials online about GraphQL or some uh, documentation about GraphQL that has these comma separated. That is now out of the spec. What happens if you pass commas? Does it kill it or? Uh, you will get a validation error um, at this point, I believe. Uh, good question. Now, what about um, relationships with, with other data. Now, you know, we've talked about, you know, how, you know, how bad REST can be for relational data and nested data. Well, GraphQL explicitly solves that problem by having uh, you provide a nested relationship um, set between your data, right? So, you, you know, let's say you have a user entity. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that top-level fields in both queries and mutations tend to be globally accessible. So that means that if you're fetching a user object, you better have that user object accessible at the first layer. And that user object contains things like first name, last name, email, and location, which is an entity in and of itself containing a city and country, right? So of course, what we get from that is first name Marty, last name McFly, and that's the result that you get. 
right? Now, this is, of course, assuming, once again, that there's only one user, right? There's only one row, because otherwise, GraphQL would provide a, uh, an array of objects, right? Now, um, what about uh, fields themselves? Well, the best way that I've found to think about fields is that fields are like functions. They're like invocable functions. They return values, yes, and they also carry arguments. And there's a really great example of this right here. So this is a GraphQL query um, that asks for an avatar, right, which could be an image of any sort of arbitrary size, but you're supplying an argument, namely height, um, with an integer, uh, and you're gonna get back that particular response. So what that looks like, is right here. Oops, there's a typo there. It should be 72 by 72. Uh, but as you can see, uh, uh, this is pretty easy and straightforward. Um, so more than one argument is possible. You can also reorder them. So if you want to put width first and height second, you can do that. Um, it really doesn't matter. Uh, but as you can see, what we're doing here in this query, in this GraphQL query, is we're asking for a user with the ID of three, sort of like our UID three. Uh, we're asking for certain details about them and then we're asking for a particular size image that, ref that is on the profile. Um, now, uh, you can also do aliasing of fields. Now, this is really powerful because GraphQL, what it really wants to do is to make the front-end developer experience very pleasant. And so, let's say you don't want to have your UID1 user, your, first, your very first user, your index user, you don't want them to have the name user because that's not very, you know, it doesn't give them very much prestige, right? Like, um, so you want to give them the name admin because they are the root user of Drupal. <laughs> um, in this case, you can use a colon separated expression that will actually uh, uh, collapse your object into a newly named admin object, right? And in this case, I decided to use Doc as the admin because he's definitely the root user. <laughs> All right, now uh, aliases are also useful for disambiguating identically named fields. So let's say you've you're decided to invoke avatar twice. You want to select two avatars, right? And you've got variable sizes. You've got one that's 72 by 72 and one that's 250 by 250. Well, the way that you can do that is by using aliases to prevent collisions between those identical names. So what you get is you get thumbnail and image as keys. Avatar is nowhere to be found. Great. So, um, now what about fragments? So fragments are sort of the underlying unit, the atomic unit of a GraphQL query. As you can see, they lie outside of the query itself, and they're, re they're referred to by um, the ellipsis followed by the name, no space in between. Um, fragments can help you to keep your document clean, because what you can do is you can inject logic uh, depending on certain uh, uh, conditions. And I'll talk a little bit more about how to actually set up these conditions shortly. You might be wondering what that on keyword means. We'll delve into that in short order. So um, fragments also allow for field, field reuse, right? So basically in this uh, case, what you saw is that the fragment contains a selection set for body. It only selects body, but it returns it to the, func to the overarching query and fills in that missing spot. Great. Now, fragments must declare types. And I'm gonna delve very deeply into types very shortly. But they allow for conditionally applied fields, right? So there's a very good example of this. Let's say that you have multiple content types in Drupal, and you have fields that are available in one content type but not in the other. You wanna be able to provide a, a, a unified means of, provide, of, of submitting a query that you can send regardless of what the content type is and still get the correct fields back. But obviously what you can do is you can't provide the fields that do not exist on a query against uh, a content type that does not have those fields. So using fragments actually helps you to resolve those problems. Um, so what you can do here, as you can see, is that if this query, if this article is in the form of a page, right? if this article has the type page, then you get um, your image and body. But if it has the type of teaser, then you don't, and you only get your smaller thumbnail image. Um, so this is what uh, it looks like if, you're, if your type is, is page, and uh, that's what it looks like when your type is teaser. Not sure what's going on with the indentation there. I'll take a look at that. Um, now, fragments can also be nested. So if you need to have you know, multiple fragments within each other, you can do that as well. As you can see, main image is a fragment that is supplying an image to the content fragment, and the content fragment is supplying the article query. Um, fragments can also be nested, um, as, as, as we said. Um, now, inline fragments uh, can be better for readability. If you really need to make your code legible and you need to make sure your queries are, are as readable as possible, you can just put your fragments directly in line. 
Um, and uh, as you can see, it does obfuscate the structure a little bit because you have to keep in mind that at this query, um, title is on the same level. Title is a sibling to body and image, right? It's only this condition that is um, offsetting that and causing that indentation. Um, and now inline fragments can also be nameless as well. So if you want to accelerate your uh, development process and uh, make it easier to read, um, either approach works very well. Now variables, uh, GraphQL has variables. So, um, uh, and, they, and they, you, you have to define a variable whenever you define a query. Um, any operation must have variables defined at the very top. And as you can see, it has the type integer, um, which I'll delve into a little bit shortly as well. Um, and uh, what you can do is if you supply this query with a variable uh, as an argument, then that argument gets supplied. You get an image with the width of an arbitrary image size that you've supplied to the query itself. Um, now, directives. So directives are not like Angular directives. Directives are, ex are, are basically alterations of execution behavior that allow you to ex you know, include or exclude fields based on what you, what you want to see in your query. Um, so at include is one. Um, this statement is basically saying only include body and image if the supplied Boolean variable is true. Um, so what this returns is this. So if has body returns to false, it only returns that object. And if it resolves to true, then you get all of the information that you could ever want. Um, so the GraphQL spec recommends supporting skip. And in this case, you can see at skip. So what it's saying is only select author if the has author Boolean is true. Oh, sorry. If it's true, sorry. If it's true, then skip author. Um, if not, then actually render it. I, that's kind of a poorly written query. I apologize. Should have uh, thought about that a little more. Now, what about mutations? So mutations are one of the sort of most quickly changing portions of GraphQL. And I do want to preface this by saying it's under a lot of change right now. There's not a whole lot of documentation about mutations. There's a lot of discussion about mutations. This is currently Facebook's uh, uh, sort of what's in the spec right now, uh, which is quite limited. So uh, mutations, in mutations, basically, all fields apart from the top of mutation fields resolve idempotently. Now, what that means is if, you know, your favorite article write method is going to cause some action that will have side effects. But what's underneath it, the node and favorite count, has no side effects because you're basically doing a selection. You're doing a read query. Um, now, if you recall back to the very first few slides about syntax, mutation operations do a write operation followed by a fetch slash read operation. So in this case, what's happening is we're writing um, using the favorite article method to say, hey, I'm going to favorite this article and put a star on it. And then we're fetching that return the updated count of the favorites on that article. So what we get back is this, which is just a read. It's just a read operation, just a fetch. We don't get the uh, uh, right method returned. Now, uh, mutations um, can be very interesting because you, know, you can supply things like a new title. Um, I'm sorry about the color coding on this. But um, you know, what you can see is, is, is once again, this, this right which nests around a, uh, um, a read operation. And that's what this looks like. So uh, after you set the title to a new title, you can change the title. And in this case, the USA Today headline has changed. Uh, all right, so now let's talk about types and schemas, um, which are very interesting as well, because they really uh, are part of, the, part of what makes GraphQL such a powerful tool. Um, firstly, uh, in GraphQL, schemas are basically capability definitions for your server, right? It um, provides you with the types and directives that will support, and hopefully you will also have some validation of your operations as well. So here are the basic scalers that GraphQL servers should have. And um, if you think about uh, uh, this, this type system, um, what you'll notice is that it's, you know, if you've worked with Go before, for example, it's actually quite similar to the, to the Go type system. And um, it's, that's actually a pretty compelling response to that criticism about, um, you know, HTTP content types, which is not really based on any paradigm that I, that I know of, and it's solely um, standardized for HTTP. Whereas this approach, you could very easily map to a GraphQL server written in Go. Um, so uh, as you can see, uh, uh, this introduces one particular scalar type that you might not be familiar with, which is ID. And that tends to be serial that's serialized as string by default, uh, generally on GraphQL server implementations. So OK, great. How do you define a type, though? Now, if you remember, if we go all the way back, you might remember that we had that capital int at the top when we defined a variable. Um, that declares what type your variable is. 
But the thing is that you're, you can declare types of your own as well, and types themselves can be objects, right? Um, so if you wanted to, this right here is a type that declares a node type, um, and this node type has certain properties, namely title, body, and image, and we've got certain types that fill in those, uh, those, those values. Um, so we always know that the title's gonna be a string, we know that the body's gonna be a string, and if you look, the value for image is actually the URL uh, uh, type which we've created elsewhere. URL is, you know, URL is not one of those base types, so it's just sort of there. Um, and what you can do actually is you can nest your type definitions, right? So what this is saying right here is if you look down at author and related, author is referring to another type known as user. Related is referring to the same type, right? So anytime you have a node type, right, you're gonna have a related um, key underneath it that will also have a node type underneath it. What does this look like in practice? Well, what this means is, this is, this is a valid query, right? Because we've got a title, which is inside our node type, and we've also got related, which is inside our type as well. But given that node itself is a type object, we need to have a further nested um, selection set inside, which will reflect the node object that's nested. Um, which means that this query is valid, this query is all good to go, but this one is not. Um, and if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because you can't fetch um, uh, you know, a, a, a null object, basically. Um, you have to ha if, if, if you have a field that requires an object underneath it, you must get the object underneath it as well. Um, now what about object field arguments? So this is where you define your field arguments, um, and if you want to be able to um, uh, uh, work with images, you can define your arguments like so, having uh, your type definitions in there as well. So of course, you know, one thing to note is that these types can be infinitely extended. Um, if you wanted to, you could have a huge amount of extraction of, on, on top of your GraphQL server that has a large set of type definitions based on whatever programming language you might want to use or whatever kind of type set you might want to use um, with your GraphQL queries. Um, object field arguments. Uh, so what this does is that um, uh, you can um, define this type object, and once that type object has been defined, now you have access to these arguments when you invoke the image field. Great. So, um, and then what about interfaces? So this is one of the cases where um, uh, you probably have seen something that looks like this, namely object-oriented PHP. Um, so interfaces are implemented by GraphQL objects to ensure a field is always present. So this is the way to make sure that you always have a field. It's like, sort, of, sort of like an internal validator, right? Because anything that implements this interface titled is going to have to have a title. Um, and what this looks like is um, if you, oh, sorry. Um, what this looks like is that if you have a, a, um, one of these implementations, one of these uh, um, implemented interfaces that does not, the instance of that, that does not have a title, then that's an invalid query. Um, so there's a lot of built-in sort of logic here that's really compelling to think about from an architectural standpoint. Um, now, if you wanted to, um, you could also uh, have your type objects that you refer to with another type objects refer to interfaces outside of that type object. So for example, we've got that titled interface, and now we're invoking it within this entity um, field. Now what that looks like is that if you want to write a query, this is a GraphQL query, uh, you've got access to that nested entity as well. <laughs> Um, and if title is a node, you can access its properties using a fragment, right? So this is where the type system gets really compelling. If you have, um, if you, uh, if we go back to the definition and you see the title is part of that, uh, that object definition, what happens is now you can declare on node um, as a condition. So you only show the body on that type. And if we go all the way back and think about um, fragments and how, they're, how, they, how they work and how they must have that on keyword plus a type, now it makes sense because um, this allows you to do things like this, where you have, oh, sorry, that's a union, but uh, this allows you to do things like setting different content types up with your GraphQL query system. Um, now unions are, uh, of course, a very fundamental part of, of databases. Um, in this case, what's happening is the um, type search, the result object can either be a node or a taxonomy term. This is one other way to sort of abstract uh, relationships between different type objects. And what you'll notice is that now we've got the opportunity to um, condition based on both of those types, right? Uh, let me just go back very quickly so you can see. So this search 
um, type object is going to return a response key with a result object inside. And this result object um, can either be something that you invoke on a node type or on a taxonomy term type. Whew. All right. Um, so that was very, very deep. Now, the last thing I want to talk about with GraphQL schemas is, is introspection. Um, so one of the things you can do is, uh, let's take this type definition, for example. If you need to debug something, if you have no idea, if you have no API documentation, you have no API spec, well, GraphQL offers you a really neat way to fix your debugging problems, to get your, um, to, to, to make it so you don't have to keep on performing all these you know, fake queries to get all the, all the understanding of the structure of your overall um, schema. And so what, this, what, so what happens is if you perform a query against the built-in field underscore underscore type, and you supply it with, let's get the name of the field, or sorry, the name of the type, and then the fields, the name of the fields, each of those types, and the names of those types. What you get is a very, very nice uh, map of your schema, right? So now you know that the node type has fields underneath it, namely title, body, and image, and title and body are strings, and image is an URL type object. So anytime you need to do any sort of introspection into your um, schema uh, within GraphQL, Great way to do it. Um, you can also use the underscore underscore schema field, which is also built in and native to access things like your default types. So as I said earlier, GraphQL has certain base types that will already be there um, that you can use. All right, so uh, that was a lot. Um, but now I want to delve into stuff that we all care about, which is GraphQL and Drupal, right? What, so I've talked about React. I've talked about Relay. I've talked about all this crazy GraphQL stuff. How does this actually change our life on as Drupal developers and while we're building Drupal sites. Well, um, how many of you have worked with decoupled architectures, headless Drupal? Um, so this might be a very interesting section for you because um, um, this whole idea of transmitting queries in a way that's client supplied, uh, uh, that is according to the definition of what the client wants, is a very, very compelling thing for all front-end developers because what it means is now you have more power, you no longer have so much control exerted over you um, by your backend and by your API uh, specification. So GraphQL and Drupal 8. Uh, well, if you were at the Barcelona keynote that Dries gave, you might have heard of um, this guy, uh, Sebastian Simpson, um, who is really spearheading the GraphQL uh, movement um, in, with, uh, within Drupal 8. If you go to this project, you'll notice that there's already a Drupal module up there. Um, he's currently working on a GraphQL implementation of a server uh, on Drupal using the native entity system, um, very similar to how web services already works. Um, so uh, I highly encourage you to check out this project. Now, the one issue is that the module is not currently installable, <laughs> as it depends on a PHP library, which needs some more work. Um, thank you, Sebastian, for giving me this information. Um, uh, he's done a lot of awesome work on this. Um, but uh, it will soon be open sourced. Uh, with documentation and examples um, on GitHub. I'm looking very forward to that. Uh, now, if you're interested in, in testing queries and testing operations, Graphical is a GUI that you can use um, that will allow you to actually uh, go in and um, uh, uh, you know, see why your, why your queries might not be validating, why your operations might be throwing errors. Um, now, let me just do a quick de demo. For those of you who have not seen this, um, you might be a little wowed, but this is what GraphQL currently looks like. Um, on your uh, Drupal 8 site with GraphQL installed along with that library that he's been working on. So here we go. Now we've got a bunch of nodes of type conference and within this conference content type we've got city, region, and year which are all custom fields within this content type. Now if you notice uh, we've now navigated to the graphical user interface and we're going to supply it with a query and now um, uh, graphical supports autocomplete if you do if you hit things like um, I think it's control space or something like that. Um, it supports a great amount of sort of um, introspection to what your query is actually going to look like. Now, um, uh, this relies on a slightly outdated version of the spec, so you might see some GraphQL that's no longer valid. Uh, but now, so that first uh, 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 query showed you an entity being fetched, a single entity. Now let's fetch a view. And now what you can see is this is fetching all of the views under that default admin content view with um, and uh, retrieving all of the, t of, of the values of the title field, right? So we're getting DrupalCon Portland, DrupalCon Sydney, DrupalCon Munich. Now if we use an argument, we can use a field-specific argument to get one of our custom fields and say, hey, I only want those which are in the region of Europe. And as you can see, all of the American um, DrupalCons along with Sydney have been removed. And bullet that. Uh, now if we use a fragment um, on our declared type, which is editing node conference, 
um, which is uh, uh, maps onto a type data API definition within Drupal. Um, we get our custom fields and we can drill down even further into this entity. And what happens is if we happen to fetch a node that is not the content type conference, those fields will not be invoked upon selection. So what we're going to get is we're going to get all these titles, but we're not going to get any city and year if um, we're fetching nodes that do not actually um, have this. But then again, with the argument field region value, that query will be invalidated since this node does not have that. <laughs> now, another thing that you can do is because of all, this, all these type definitions and the way this has been constructed, you can actually drill down further into the entity as well of the user who created it. And so in this case, we have UID going down into the name of the user and the value, which in this case is admin. And there's an alias being demonstrated as well. Right now what we're doing is we're aliasing that UID field to take on the name author. And if you look at the response, it comes back with author. So that's a really quick, uh, a very, very blazing fast um, demonstration of what, what the power of Drupal 8, um, what, a, what the power of a GraphQL server in Drupal 8 could look like. Right? Now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, awesome. Um, you know, we've, we've gotten a lot of work done, but the thing is, didn't we just spend five years with the Whiskey Initiative <laughs> building just, just this, the REST server in Drupal core? Well, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of work still to be done. The spec is still in a lot of, uh, uh, of, of, of is in a very confused state at the moment. But some of the next steps for the module that Sebastian plans is access control. Right now, GraphQL, there's not really a best practice around authentication and security. And given, <laughs> you know, very important concerns about security with Drupal, access control is something we have to scrutinize. Mutation support. So currently, all those queries that you saw were read queries. They were all um, query operations. We need mutation support as well. Now that gets a little trickier because you know the mapping becomes a little different. The schemas are not as well lined up because instead of having just fields within fields, you have fields within a method, and that becomes kind of tricky. So um, the last thing uh, is schema and type configurability. Um, so Sebastian uh, uh, has been working on this um, uh, interesting approach using YAML to configure your schema and, and, and define your types. Um, or using a UI that's built into the module. So very exciting times, very exciting times for um, seeing GraphQL and Drupal 8. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit just briefly in the little time that we have left about what the future of GraphQL looks like. Well, Facebook has talked a little bit um, ever since they released the spec about four months ago. Um, they delved very deeply into uh, uh, how it works with Relay and this new application approach known as Flux, um, if you've heard of that. Um, so the spec is in heavy flux, no pun intended. Features are still being added. As I noted, uh, mutations in the documentation are not very well represented. Um, but uh, the, we are seeing a great deal of solidification around certain uh, paradigmatic approaches. Um, Facebook plans to build a lot more tools that natively support GraphQL. One example of this is the JavaScript reference implementation that you can find right now if you go to the Facebook GraphQL website. Um, and that actually is something you can use right now as, um, a, as, a, as a means to get this stuff working on your local machine. Um, WebSocket support was announced recently, uh, uh, and details will be added soon, um, both to the spec and to the JavaScript implementation. Now, the, the, the very interesting thing about this, of course, is that WebSockets introduced a whole new interesting area um, surrounding how uh, we actually deliver payloads and how we actually um, uh, do these um, transmissions between server and client, um, which means that we have to support that in Drupal as well. Um, so that will be coming in the future. Uh, and now, of course, what about decoupled Drupal? Well, we've been building all these decoupled architectures with Drupal using typical REST paradigms. Um, well, developers of Drupal-backed React applications will see a lot of benefit earlier because um, Sebastian is planning to include uh, an integration layer with um, Relay as well. So you can use React and Relay as part of your stack um, with GraphQL. Um, but since GraphQL is transport agnostic, you can use any client-side framework that submits queries. So if you want to, you could theoretically use Angular or Backbone or Ember, um, anything that submits queries to a, an endpoint. Um, so a GraphQL server in Drupal could serve clients lightweight responses in one single application bootstrap. We no longer have to do all this crazy stuff with multiple round trips or multiple, which all require corresponding bootstraps, by the way, of Drupal. Um, and of course, the same server could interpret many different query structures and tailor responses accordingly, which means that we could rebuild views using GraphQL potentially. Um, so there's a whole lot of interesting, you know, interesting discussion around here, which is what if we could build a more performant version of views, right? that allows us to get much more interesting permutations of the data that we want. Very interesting stuff. So up for discussion, um, just as our, as our uh, last, bit of Q, uh, last bit of discussion, um, what is the future of technologies like GraphQL? 
And what about stuff like Netflix's Falcor? Well, if you've heard of Falcor, Falcor is, is, a, is a similar approach to GraphQL that takes a completely different tack. Um, Falcor focuses more on, on consolidating, um, consolidating queries that fire against multiple endpoints. Um, whereas GraphQL is really focused on a single endpoint, unifying all queries against a single endpoint. Falcor actually basically you know, presumes and acknowledges um, the fact that you will probably have multiple endpoints, and it allows you to provide this abstraction layer that will fire queries against multiple endpoints, but then sing, send back a single response. Really cool stuff. But um, very different from GraphQL. How does that impact our, our, uh, uh, um, our web services approach? Um, and what impact might that have on us? I encourage you to check out Falcor as well. It's a very compelling video uh, made about Falcor. Um, it's a very, very interesting system. And what is the future of web services in Drupal, as I mentioned, in light of GraphQL? Should we prioritize implementation of a GraphQL server? Um, is this something that is very important from the perspective of Drupal 8.1 or even Drupal 9? Um, what should we think about in that regard? And finally, what is the future, or, or second to last, what is the, uh, the future of decoupled architectures in the front end with, with GraphQL? What sorts of things can we do now in the front end with GraphQL? Can we actually build things like an abstract query builder that's you know, hiding behind the UI and that will actually allow the user to fetch data themselves in a very interesting way without us having to do all the busy work for them? Very interesting uh, uh, points there as well. And finally, what is the future of RESTful architectures and the server-client relationship in light of GraphQL? Um, what are things like WebSockets going to do, uh, uh, these new transport mechanisms? Um, how are we going to deal with things like persistent connections? Um, all things that are very important to us as a Drupal community uh, when we're dealing with things like full-page refreshes, not, um, optimistic feedback, non-blocking UIs. What does that look like in terms of how we build applications? So with that, um, thank you very much. Here's how you can get a hold of me, um, and I hope you enjoyed this uh, all too fast <laughs> talk. Uh, are they slides going to be up? Yes. Thank you. So, as you might have noticed, I, I had some, a, a few small problems with the slides, but, but they will be up very soon. Um, I'm also going to include a list of resources if you're interested in learning more about the spec, reading more articles, reading more tutorials about GraphQL. I will have a list of all that information online. Um, please, please, please send me some feedback. I'd be very excited to hear about what you thought of the session um, and um, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, you can bring it down. How about a quick question? <laughs> yeah, sure. So what do you think like, is going to be like really production ready? Kind of replace, like right now, we, we are building on like REST with the uh, head of Drupal. So what do you think will you kind of the transition? We can actually use it in production. Right. Well, right now you can use it in production, but you need to have a sort of more isomorphic JavaScript approach, so using Node.js, MongoDB. Um, however, there are multi many, many different libraries being built right now that allow for integrate for a, for your provision a GraphQL server. Um, I know that there's a library for Python, for Scala, for Java. Um, there's there's one sort of boilerplate one for PHP. Um, so there's ways to do it. I you know I think that given how Changeable the spec is right now, and how quickly the language is evolving. I would give it a few months. Okay. Um, I'm gonna guess that the mutation. I just. I mean. Talking about mutations will probably be solidified in the next three to six months. I would say. Um, but then again, you know, they just removed the comma-separated fields, so... What's, you know, the reason, what's, what's the reason for that? Uh, well, the reason is because, so Facebook has used GraphQL solely internally yeah. for a very long time, and by open sourcing it, they're hoping to figure out, you know, better ways to do what they're doing. Um, namely, I think that, personally, I think that they're, the way that they're doing mutations is a little bit um, funky. It's not the most sort of... It's, it's not the best. Um, I think there are better ways to do it. Um, but then again, you know, it, it all depends on what the spec emerges to be. So um, I would say production ready, you know, if you want to build a site using GraphQL with Drupal, it's going to be a while. <laughs> it's going to probably be like a year, but um, with uh, uh, definitely like a, like a fully ready, scalable stuff, I would say within the next six to nine months, you can definitely see enough progress, certainly, because there's a lot of tooling being built right now around this. There's already a lot of work being done to actually build an ecosystem around it. So that's, what, that's the work that's being done right there. So is Facebook the main driver in terms of the schema changes? Yes. So Facebook, uh, it, Facebook owns the spec. Yeah, exactly. uh, it's open source. You know, I, I forget what license they're using, but 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 Facebook uh, um, is sort of the the main um, perpetrator. They, they've got like a, a whole team of developers working on it, um, and they're very involved in the React community as well. So, yeah, cool, very interesting stuff. Thank you. Great yeah, talk. Yeah, thank you.
Yeah, good talk. Uh, Thank you. You may have mentioned it, uh, but they're, are they building a PHP uh, framework way for like a PHP client? Yes. So if you have a, if you want to Drupal to talk to Drupal via GraphQL server side, right? Uh, is that is there thought behind that or? Are I think so. I think so. That's interesting because I actually haven't heard of any work being done yet on um, you know Drupal two Drupal uh -huh. uh, uh, GraphQL transmissions, but um, certainly. Uh, very soon, um, okay. there should be that. You know, the thing is that um, um, as a as a paradigmatic shift, though, you know, like like GraphQL is pretty interesting from yeah. from the standpoint of what we're doing right now with Rust. However, you know, the the fact of the matter is people have to build tools for it, mm -hmm. and you know, there's a lot of tools being built right now. You know, as I mentioned, a lot of libraries, but um, a lot of them aren't really functional yet, such as the one that's being built for Drupal sure. and PHP. Um, but hopefully soon. Um, I'll, I'll do some digging for you, and, okay. and um, if you leave me a card or tweet at me sure. or something, I'll, yeah. I'll dig into that. Because um, there's a lot of uh, uh, resources around Or that. even just PHP library, because I do, we do a lot of work in City CRM and ah, right. connect with Drupal, and there's a lot of opportunities to, to connect those different things together mm -hmm. or have like Thanks. one City CRM uh, implementation. Sure. Uh, Talking to another one. So. Sure. Yeah. Just third party databases outside of the yeah. uh -huh. Exactly. And that's one of the things that um, I think is very interesting. One thing I didn't mention about views is you know, what if you could use um, views against non Drupal databases? GraphQL is one way to accomplish that. You, know, you, could, you, could, th you could theoretically have a Drupal install that does not rely on. Um, any sort of MySQL database and could rely on other databases um, or could, in fact, fetch against, you know, any variety of different... Um, and I might be, I mean, even like that remote entities talk yesterday. You could, you know, have entities using GraphQL fetching stuff from wherever. Exactly. And expose it as an entity and that would be real powerful. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and one of the really interesting things also that's happening right now with services in Drupal 8 uh -huh. is yeah. that, um, so I don't know if you know, like, so, so like web services deals with content entities um, you know, which are like taxonomy terms, users, nodes, that's basically it. Um, services, you know, does a whole lot. It does, you know, custom endpoints, custom uh, uh, resources, all that kind of stuff. But the really interesting thing that, that they're doing right now, uh, which is, you know, not, not very advisable from a security standpoint, is to allow you to actually perform a request that will provision a new endpoint. So <laughs> you could okay. theoretically write a GraphQL query that produces another endpoint for you to write more GraphQL oh, queries yeah. on and do that algorithmically or programmatically and recursively if you wanted to. Interesting. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, there's there's talk about that as well. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, very cool. Cool. Yeah. So, cool. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. All right. <clears throat>